Finally, color commentary from the one and only attorney Julia just goes ah, bah, bah. I, wow. I, I, okay, he's original. only known me for thirty something years, so it's it's there's time. All right. <clears throat> Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. This week we continue our retrospective dedicated to the films of Bela Lugosi, this time with Lugosi's shocking performance in the 1934 film The Black Cat. Bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of horror fans who have seen it. So warning, spoilers ahead. From Denver, Colorado, I'm your host Jason Henderson, author of this winter's Young Captain Nemo from Five and Friends Macmillan Books. With me from Austin is Tony Sabaggio, tech director at Rooster Teeth, lead singer and bassist of the band Desert to Mars, and lead guitarist of the band Rise from Fire. Say hello, Tony. Howdy. And also in Austin, writer of the long-running underground comic series Halloween Man, winner of the 2018 Best of Austin Award from the Austin Chronicle, Mr. Drew Edwards. Say hello. 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 And finally, also in Denver, as always, color commentary from attorney Joya Guzman of Guzman Immigration of Denver. Say hello, Joya. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Gosh, this is an exciting one to talk about. Uh, the Black Cat is a 1934 American pre-code horror film directed by Edgar Ulmer, starring Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff. And that was a big, big deal. It was Dracula and Frankenstein together. In a film, the picture was the first of eight movies, six of which were from Universal. To pair the two actors, it became Universal Pictures' biggest box office hit of the year. It was also notable being one of the first movies with an almost continuous music score. Lugosi also appeared in a 1941 film of the same name. So let's get our opening thoughts. Uh, Julia, it's been a while since we've had you speak first. Let's go Julia, Drew, who is our our sort of curator of the Lugosi experience, Tony, and then uh, I will take us into the conversation. So, Joya, uh, opening thoughts, The Black Cat. I feel like I opened recently, but that's, I'm happy to open again. Um, I thought this film was really interesting. I um, liked the look of it. I thought the sets were neat, and, and the, certainly the people are striking and amazing. I mean, to see Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi on the same screen uh, for the first time, you know, for, for in, in terms of them being on the screen for the first time in this film, uh, was really cool. And um, some really interesting uh, choices and, uh, that were made. However, this film is so dark. I mean, I just felt really depressed after watching it. And um, and I really hated the way that the women are portrayed in this film. I mean, they're just completely useless damsels in distress. Uh, so that part, you know, as far as, as that goes. But because we have seen some films from this era that have some really neat, strong women characters. This is not one of those. Um, so, yeah, there was definitely just kind of a sad, sick feeling in my gut when we, when we were done watching the film. But, uh, but yeah, it's fairly really neat looking and um and lots of, of interesting performances fantastic drew i know that this was one of the ones that you wanted to uh bring to us when when we said hey let's do let's do a month of lugosi so uh why black cat and what are your thoughts about it well i think this is an important movie in lugosi's career because it is the first of eight team-up movies he did with Boris Karloff. And I would argue that this is the best of the lot, uh, with The Raven maybe being the second best. And it's the one where I feel like they have the most equal footing, because if you watch any of the other uh, Bella Boris team-up movies, uh, they, one or the other uh, gets more screen time than the other, but I think you know in this one both characters are interesting and have an equal level of importance. Um, it's a very striking movie because it looks very different from all the other Universal horror movies because uh, Boris Karloff's castle in this movie is this crazy Art Deco haunted house which looks very science fictiony for the time period, and you know so it's a distinct looking movie. And it's interesting to me, we have these two, uh, as, as you said, uh, Dracula and Frankenstein together. Um, both of them are playing their characters with only minimal to no, no real makeup in the case of, of uh, Bela Lugosi. So, you, you know, it, it's both men are playing kind of human 
monsters. Although Lugosi is, is kind of almost a quasi, I would say at least an anti-hero character in this movie. He's not an out and out villain, which is interesting. Um, so I just think this is a, a fun, fun, fun movie. Uh, you know, for other reasons, which we will will get into as, as we discuss it. But I, I definitely knew this had to be part of the Lugosi discussion because the the, the, the Lugosi Karloff rivalry and, and we can get into how real or imagined that was uh, is, is such a big part of Lugosi lore. And this is the mo- first movie that they were ever together. So I think it's it's important. Fantastic. Uh, Tony. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I really like this movie. I I know I haven't seen it in a long, long time, so it was really kind of fresh and new for me. Um, the idea of, you know, Legosi and Karloff duking it out in this duel, I mean, you know, eventually literally uh, playing a chess game against each other uh, for stakes higher than you know, most games of chess, all that stuff is really great. Um, it's really the house they, that, you know, Karloff's character has built is amazing. Um, and, you know, because so much deco has been appropriated for kind of neo noir and, uh, you know, sci fi, it looks very science fiction y, you know. Um, uh, I think Ex Machina, you yeah. know, it feels like. It could be that house uh, at this time period, <laughs> yeah. Know, with, with Satanists and sort of robots, I guess. But yeah, it's I I really enjoyed it. It's so weird to see all these like one hour movies as well. Isn't that interesting? Um, but yeah. you know, it clips along. It feels feels pretty good. Um, with the exception, of course, of uh, you know what Julia's bringing up, where the the women in the movie definitely are uh, you know meant there. You know, they're there to be saved or ogled or sacrificed. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, it's pretty good. I, I enjoyed it. I'm fascinated by this this thing where we used to have hour long movies, you know, with the occasional exceptions of things like Reds or Doctor Zhivago, you know, and and just recently Avengers ran two hours and forty, and the producers of the Avengers have said they think the era of the two hour movie is over, and from now on to tell a good story, it's going to have to be three. I don't know what to make of that. What I can tell you is that I can point to lots of 60 minute films that introduce their themes, give us variations on the theme. In this case, the theme is honestly, I have to tell you, I think the theme is the, is mechanized death. It's the destruction of, of, of Europe by world war one and how everybody, uh, including Bela Lugosi were haunted by that. And uh, it does that in 60 minutes and then we're done. So let's get started. Uh, this um, this film gets moving really, really quickly. We have a very lovely young couple honeymooning uh, in Hungary, and it, they're they're settling. They're gonna like just sort of nuzzle one another, I guess, all the way to their honeymoon spot. When it turns out that their their little car has their train compartment has been oversold, and Doctor Vitus Verdegast Bel Lugosi, a psychiatrist has also been sold a ticket in their compartment. And so he comes in and we get to see Bell Lugosi for the first time. And I have to tell you, Bell Lugosi in the 1950s uh, went to, I think this is 1957, went to a uh, repertory showing of the Black Cat and apparently howled to the entire audience as he was sitting in the theater, what a magnificently beautiful bastard I was to, the, to, to everyone. And, and it's true. <laughs> He looks great. <laughs> he's, you know, he's he's looking swell. He's wearing this pretty swell, like, tweed suit like you might wear because you're going on a trip to the countryside. You know, he, he looks dapper and and uh, uh, cool. Not, uh, not at all like Dr. Miracle from last week. No. <laughs> no. He's the, he's the opposite of the wild-haired carny dr miracle who presumably was a scientist he's dracula but he's a very sympathetic uh he's he's Mm. extremely sympathetic i think well to a point there are times when he is and then you then he says and does things they're like no man i'm not on board anymore well there's i I did not find him sympathetic there is a reason for that it, mm. uh, although i actually would argue it makes the the movie interesting cuz it made him sure. a more complicated character so the film the, the 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 studio gave ulmer a lot of money to shoot this movie and um 
Bella Lugosi was reportedly originally his character was more out and out a villain and um that's they shot a lot of scenes with that in mind and then they they went went back because bella lugosi was like man i've I've played dracula i've played dr miracle you know i would like to play a character that is a little bit more sympathetic so they actually went back in and and shot new scenes to make this character more sympathetic now that there it does cause some problems because there's some some maybe some in, inconsistencies uh with the logic in this movie in places but i do think it makes lugosi's character a lot more interesting than yeah. the than sure. than he would it if, if he if he was just a a typical stock and trade you know dracula type um I I really like Lugosi in this movie. Like Ulmer reportedly told him to overemphasize his over his his very his already very thick accent when he was doing this movie. And I I kind of believe that because the first time I saw this movie when I was in high school, I did actually have a hard time understanding what Lugosi was saying. Like even more difficult than I normally did. And, you know, he also apparently pulled Karloff way, way back. And, and Karloff didn't really like that. Like, he was like, oh, I, you're, you're, you're directing me to act like a corpse. And, and yeah, I think, you know, the two of them together, like, his Lugosi runs really hot in this movie. And Karloff runs very cold. And I think that that, uh, I think that, that makes the dynamic really cool. I think it's useful to think whenever it comes up about uh, alternate ways this movie was intended to go. And yet at the same time, I can't help but think that despite all those rewrites, what we get is a stronger film. And we'll kind of go through that along the way. But what I like is, is given that this is an only, only an hour long picture right here, we're taking our time setting up who the, basically the real villain of the picture is because you have this sort of morose doctor. He's a, says he's a psychiatrist, a Hungarian psychiatrist. And he says, I'm going, uh, I'm going to see my friend, Yalmar Peltzig, who is an Austrian architect. And we start to talk about, uh, this, this, um, this guy that we're going to go see, but we don't yet know why, but we've already heard the name is out there. And, and very quickly, uh, we move from the train to a bus where that's going to take, take uh, the, the young honeymooners to where, whatever hotel they're going to or, or what have you. And, and I'm not sure exactly, I don't recall exactly where Lugosi is going at the moment. It doesn't even matter because the bus crashes, but before the bus crashes, we have this really, wondrous moment where the driver says this road was built by the hungarian army and world war one was terrible here and right over that ravine the uh the bodies were 15 deep and the river was choked with blood and the young people david manners and julie bishop the young honeymooners are listening sort of wrapped and this is kind of a weird spooky tale for them Bell Lugosi, all the blood is drained from his face and he's closed his eyes as though he has to endure listening to this. And it's very important because World War, World War II hasn't happened yet. World War I, you know, uh, Bell Lugosi fought in World War I. He really did fight against the Russians. According to David Scal, uh, there was a story that Bell Lugosi told that he actually had at one point hid himself by hiding himself under corpses, which is not that unusual in a war where, where sometimes fields were just literally choked with the dead such that to walk across the field, the only way to do it would be to be walking on flesh. And uh, you can see, it, again, he's an actor, all right, so he's presenting this to us. But you can see in him just the hauntedness of sheer barbarism, unknown before the prior, like, 20 years, and now just a part of our past, and now becoming a part of folklore and fairy tales, such that these young people, they don't know anything about it. Uh and no sooner do we say all that stuff, these roads are built by the Hungarian army and a bunch of people died here, than the road just collapses and the bus flips over. Um, and 
I think is that what happened? The road collapsed. I thought he the he the, the road the, the road thing goes off the road, but as I saw it, the the road gives way a little bit. The corner of the well, um, it is a dark and stormy night. It is indeed, yeah. and the rain <laughs> is chewing up the road like crazy. And well, just... and the guy keeps looking back to talk to them, which was really unner- unnerving to me. <laughs> I was like, yes, Quit looking back. To them. <laughs> so yeah. that that darkness that Julia talked about starts right away. We're moving through a place of death. And the place itself is crumbling uh, and and cannot be trusted. And your hosts are idiots. Or as it turns out, they'll be either they're either going to be fools or they're going to be evil. Because uh, right now your hosts are idiots. They tell you a scary story and then they flip over the bus. The driver's dead and the rest of them make their way to this, yeah, this amazing Art Deco palace that has been built, we learn, on top of uh, the site of, of a great war, this fort that the, um, that the masterpiece was in of. of construction over the masterpiece of destruction, as Lugosi says. Wow. The lines are incredible. I mean, seriously, this thing is just chock, again, 60 minutes, right? So this thing is chock-a-block with great lines. Uh, it, uh, and, and you're right. Um, Bell Lugosi has a lot of them. I mean, he sometimes chews through them because his, his you know, his, um, his English is so shaky that at times he even rewrites the lines himself a little bit so that something like the scene of his crime becomes the place of his crime because Bell Lugosi doesn't know from idiom. So if he remembers one word over another, you know, whatever. Uh, and and they, they go to this... Uh, oh, oh, and... I'm sorry. The girl is injured. She's so I think um, the the husband is is carrying her. So they go quickly to the castle, and right away, uh, Bella Gossi's like, "I need some I need some medicine to treat the the girl who's injured." Uh, and this is the moment when we meet um, Boris Karloff, the master of the castle. Does somebody want to describe how how Boris Karloff presents himself uh, in in this one? Well, what I said was that. It- seem like this is where Michael Myers was inspired from because we see him lying down and then suddenly he sits up with a super straight back just like Michael Myers does in in Halloween and uh and and then he gets up and his he just cuts this really striking figure he's got a really um a waist hugging suit so that he just looks like an athlete and he's tall and scary looking and pale and <laughs> just so yeah. odd <laughs> and well, the house got, is so he, mod and, and interesting it's very madman good true he's got this crazy pointy hairstyle yeah, that, yeah. like I I don't even really know how the like he's got like a like the letter M cut into his head head and his head hair is like completely white and yeah. You know, he looks very, 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 very thin. And it's yes. funny because, like, you know, a lot of people, when they think of Karloff, of course, they think of Frankenstein monster. And they think of him as this big, tall, strapping guy. And, you know, a lot of that was padding. So, right. like, this is this is really more what he was built like. And I I I find that to be really it's, it's just as Julia says, it's extremely striking figure with the way they have him made up and the way they've costumed him and everything. And he looks far more abnormal than Bela Lugosi. Yes. Yeah. Bela Lugosi has no, there's nothing unnatural about the way Bela Lugosi is presenting himself. He's just a guy. He's just a psychiatrist in a suit, but this, they've well, walked in. He's got the, he's got the super slicked back Dracula hair and he's yes. creepy and he's got the accent. So he's still creepy. But he is, right, but he's his own so. special effect. Yeah. But Karloff, all the to the extent that money's gone into costuming, it's all gone into Karloff. He has this. He wears a, a sort of a kimono all the time, over a sort of tunic that, as you mentioned, just accentuates what an extremely thin um, build Karloff has. His his hairpiece is very strange and cool. Like you said, it's like a, it's this, and, and they were patterning him after. Uh, Alistair Crowley, and they were trying to create the idea of what does the perfect satanic priest look like? And what they came up with is is this. He's got, uh, again, this super strange hair and, and, the, and the silky robes. Um, 
and he's an architect. I think this is this is really amazing because very quickly, what's going on, and, and I think you know you could rip this off today. It's still a great idea. You've got these two powerful individuals that we watching at home go, hey, we've also got two powerful characters of Hollywood. We got Lugosi and Karloff, but two powerful individuals, a psychiatrist and an architect, and they meet one another. And the architect is like, what the fuck are you doing in my house? And Lugosi's like. I'm here because you betrayed all my men and I've been, spent a bunch of time in prison. We're going to deal with that. And then you've got these honeymooners and they're like, but we're going to pretend to be genteel towards one another as long as we are in the same room with those people. And it's so cool because it means there's always this tension where these two men are pretending that they don't want to take the moment that they are alone to like literally like tear one another's throats out. It's great. I I I I really I really enjoy that. So um, I want to pause yeah. on this for a second because I, I I feel like this is a good point to bring this up. Yeah. There is this idea that Lagosi and Karloff didn't like each other, which isn't near as I can tell from what I've read, isn't largely true while they were making actually making movies together. And in fact, they actually enjoyed each other's company quite a bit in as far as everything they read and they respected each other and everything um and it seems like everything about this rivalry was based on resentment that Lugosi might have had later on in his career when he was doing P poverty row mm -hmm. movies and things like that but as far as like the filming of the black cat like i can't find a, a single verifiable story that Lugosi yeah. and Karloff didn't get along at this point. No, and, and Karloff had only good things to say about Lugosi. Truly only good things. Actually, when did, when did Karloff die? I'm sorry. Karloff died in 68, I believe. Okay, so it's after the 50s, but before, obviously before his death. And he was, and he spoke of how Lugosi was kind and how, but he also talked about how Lugosi often felt very uh, uh, displaced and lonely. And it translated into a kind of a bitterness. Um, you know, this is Karloff psychoanalyzing Lugosi, right? But a lot of it had to do, he said, with that. He says Lugosi never learned the language well enough. And that was a great hindrance to him. Again, that's uh, Karloff talking about Lugosi. It, it, you know, so, um, you know, who knows? Uh, uh, some of Lugosi's widows felt like Karloff wasn't as nice to him as he could have been. But, you know, yeah, everything I've read was that they were very, you know, that Lugosi was jealous that Karloff had a much better career in later years. But um, I, I've never heard that it was, like, really ugly between them, you know, especially in person. I do have one thing to point out. Apparently in the 50s, when uh, Lugosi was quite old, his uh, wife woke up and he was um, uh, delirious and believed that Karloff was haunting him. Uh, that Karloff was uh, was in his living room. Uh, so Lugosi had nightmares of Karloff, which I find fascinating. Hmm. Yeah. I, mean, I have a morbid curiosity of was it Karloff or was it like Frankenstein's monster Karloff or was it Black Hat? Like I, yeah, I wonder I in, in a kind of like, you know, Jacob Marley kind of way, what, or was it an ever changing? Yeah. I don't know. I, and I, no disrespect to the dead. It just, in my brain, I, I, I just, I'm curious what, which Karloff was it? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Because <laughs> well, she but... said only that he was just shouting and he said, Karloff, Karloff is here, which I just find fascinating. The the thing is about that, though, is I think people hear these stories where Lugosi was older and he was addicted to drugs and everything. And they're things that ex-wives are telling. So who knows how true they are or <laughs> <true>. whatever. <laughs> but like, so people hear these things and they somehow translate the that they push that all the way back into the 30s. Yeah. And, you know, it, you just don't hear about that sort of stuff going on at this point, no, you right. know, and I, I think that so I think like that's a myth that they hated each other's guts that somehow got popularized because of stuff like that. And, yeah. you know, it just doesn't seem like it was the case. I'm not, and I'm not saying there's nothing entirely to it, but I think it, it happened, you know, when, when, when Lugosi was way, way older and, you know, like, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, if you're Lugosi and, you know, you're, you're, you know, it's the 1950s and suddenly you're having to do, you know, plant, you know, like, like, 
bride of the monster or whatever you know that might yeah. make you that might make you bitter but oh, yeah. uh you know it's it's you know it's not a, for whatever it is it's not apparent in this film oh, no. and they actually they actually have a lot of chemistry with each other fantastic there is a weird love going on between them so like i said the moment that that uh lugosi walks in he uh he goes you betrayed everybody at this fort to the russians you know you betrayed your hungarian comrades to the russians you survived i went to prison i lost my wife and daughter and i'm going to get you back and Karloff is such a such a pompous and confident badass in this castle he's got. And he's like, "Don't be ridiculous," you know. And then the guy walks in, and they're like, "Let's have some, let's have some whiskey," and you know. So we know that a lot is up. Now, very very quickly after that, we get a look at the secret life of uh, of Yalmer Peltzik, the Boris Karloff character, and. Uh, <laughs> Drew, do you want to explain what the hell is going on in the in the subterranean depths of the castle Peltzik? Uh, so he is the leader of a satanic cult, oh, and God. he has um, women that he has been sacrificing, frozen or taxidermed or whatever, in glass. Yeah, that he can walk around and and check them out and everything, and. You know, I no, always... not only that, but they're suspended so they look like they're floating. Yes, yes. Yeah. Their hair is even floating up. Like it's a super crazy looks... art piece. It's crazy. Yeah. I, I've always kind of wondered if this was the inspiration, at least somewhat visually, for the Mister Freeze character on Batman the Animated Series with oh. his 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 wife suspended in the in the the tube because there's you know something about the image of Karloff looking at these suspended frozen women that just always makes me think of Mr. Free even though you know Mr. Freeze is a terribly uh sad character and this incarnation and in, in in Karloff's character in this movie is just an utter scumbag it's so beautifully lit the way these women are shown in these glass cases and they show Karloff walking amongst his collection of them. Um, I think that's a wonderful observation, by the way. I think, I, I think that Mr. Freeze, yeah, there's something to that. There's no way in heck that they didn't have that, at least in their heads, when they were thinking of different examples of how this, how that frozen woman could be hung in front of, uh, in front of Mr. Freeze. But I mean, Jesus, it also, if you look at it, uh, it even harkens back to, uh, to me, it harkens back to, to Metropolis, you know, with, uh, with Maria well, hanging there. Well, Ulmer was, a was one of the set dressers, uh, or, or an allegedly involved in the set design on Metropolis. No kidding. Well, I mean, that, that comes through in the sense. lighting. I mean, the lighting blows me away in this thing. It's really gorgeous. Uh, so, well, I have yes. to interrupt, though. And, and yes, it is attractive and interesting looking. But um, just when you're talking about Ulmer and how he's involved with all this, I, I was telling I was telling the guys before that we started recording that I was reading um, the IMDb about what a sadist Ulmer was and how he uh, was totally abusive of Lucille Lund because she had rejected him when he asked her to be his girlfriend. And so at one point, I'm not exactly sure what he had done to her, but Harry, Harry Cording had to save her life um, when he got her off the slab table and she was bleeding from the mouth. And at another point, uh, Elmer had left her hanging in one of those cases, in the glass case, by these, I guess they had like special canvas panties is what they were using that had wires in them. And he just left her hanging there for, during lunch, for the whole lunch hour and she was in there for like an hour and nobody, uh, nobody realized it. So awesome. I, it's, you know, it may be attractive, but it sure came as, at a price for this this poor woman who is who else. That is, you could never get away with that. Oh. I, 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 that's appalling. I mean, just first of all, her oh. union. I mean, I'm sure it did happen then. What I mean is, like now, if you were going to have an actress, like first of all, you'd have a stunt a stunt actress do this instead of having your actual actress hang. Well, her, that's if it, if it makes you feel any better, uh, Julia. Ulmer as a director was regulated to filming B movies after this because he made the mistake of falling in love and seducing the script girl on this movie who was married to Carl Limley, the studio head's nephew. And <laughs> 
So he he didn't even though this movie was a big success for for uh, yeah, but I'm sure he had, he used that woman too. Yeah, Shirley was her name. Shirley um, Shirley uh, Shirley Castle is the, the woman's mm. name. But yeah, I'm sure he was abusive toward her as well because you don't uh, you don't decide not to do that anymore once you get married, as, as Tony was pointing out. So, God yeah. bless. So that's astonishing. Okay, so uh, and and it gives us a moral quandary because these shots are amazing. Uh, and also, apparently, they are done with a special effect that is apparently quite painful for the actresses uh, enduring it. And so the rig is the rig is painful. And what they should have done, what you would responsibly do, is if somebody has to wear a painful rig, you have them wear it for a few seconds at a time while you put the camera on them, and then you move the camera away. And you do tricks like just have them standing on a box at other points when you only need them like in a quarter of the shot. And uh, so... Yep, yet another time when we're when we're morally conflicted by being amazed uh, amazed by a shot. Uh, so yes, he's got his. And I have to say, by the way, at this point, I'm totally down with the presentation of Peltzig, you know, of Karloff as he walks amongst his cases of preserved women. It's so bizarre. Uh, I have to say later on when it's revealed he's a full-on satanic priest and he's got a big congregation. Well, and he's got masses. Lugosi's wife down there. Oh, yes. Well, I just, I just yeah. want to say I, I'm liking this stuff so far. I, I'm I, Because, again, super crazy, weird dude. And he's an architect, which is something that brings to mind people's main concern about the Great War, which is the mechanization of death. And so the idea that that is all balled up into the character of a man who calls himself an architect is is just really, really meaningful. And yes, he has got Bela Lugosi's wife, who apparently we learned through dialogue and whatever, he married and he is sleeping with a woman who appears to be blitzed out of her mind uh, who is Bela Lugosi's daughter, who he married after his uh, his first wife, her mom, died. Truly yeah, nuts. All kinds of creepy. But then yes. it's weird, too, and you can kind of see what Drew was talking about earlier, where they, they kind of reshot it to make him slightly more sympathetic. You know, Lugosi, you Lugosi starts Lugosi, out. Yeah. yeah, Lugosi. So, you know, Karloff's character is just off the rails as far <laughs> as bad news goes. Lugosi has like, hey, you know, we should save this couple. Um, we have this, I, you know, what you did to me and my wife is terrible. But then he also, when they're talking, uh, he goes, well, I, you know, are you gonna let him go? He's like, well, no, I want the girl. <laughs> like, she, she's a lot like my, my, you know, former wife. I really, no, nah, she's gonna be mine. I, you know, I just had to take care of you first. I but believe me, I I totally forgot he said. I believe you, but I I forgot that I, if he uh, when they're talking over chess, like at over the, the chess beginning, and then eventually they're playing chess for her. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You because know, and and until the very end, you know, Legosi doesn't even know about the daughter. Yeah, he finds out a terrible way. But right. yeah, there's a there's a a thing where he seems at first you know hey we should let him go well <laughs> so, um but of course you know there is a kind of a change of heart eventually but you know they're in peril the whole time well this um, is this is kind of shades of evil what evil you know like right. like you have you have one and which is why i say you know he's he's an anti-hero at sure of course he's a thousand times more interesting than and i actually think out of all the universal horror movies this is the best that david manners ever was but mm -hmm. uh he's still not he's a pretty milkos hero he's not He's not that interesting. So Bela Lugosi, you know, gets all the, 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 you know, charisma that you would normally try to put into your protagonist. And because he's vaguely less evil than, than uh, Karloff, I, well, he becomes more sympathetic by, by tenfold. Well, yeah. there's also some great bits where even when he appears, there's a, like almost a hypnotic attraction uh, to him. Yeah. And it's weird because, you know, <laughs> the husband never really seems to pick up on that, even though it happens multiple times. I mean, there's a point where he's like, hey, we have to get out of here. I don't care. Like, yeah, take a car, take a boat, take a train. You can go by Zyke bike, like any, you know. That was some neat stuff. out of here. I but, liked uh, that moment. That's during she, the chess, she's also the chess like, game. oh, yeah, we're, it's, 
Yeah. I now that I know, uh, now that I have, I'm fully conscious. We are gonna get the hell out, no matter what, right? Um, and that was that was great, but he before this he's clueless. Every time she kind of looks at Lugosi, she is has this like hypnotic yeah uh, look, and he's like, hmm, weird. Like he never he never seems to pick up on that at all. Yeah, it's just uh, yeah. He's he's, he's too much an innocent, and right. and Lugosi here being this older, uh, very sort of genteel European uh doctor is is intriguing always intriguing but ultimately out of her reach you know she is married into this very traditional they're the they're the heroes and they're going to stay that way um so the most that's going to happen is just going to be this strange sort of fascination of uh with bella lugosi who will be in the end kind of like like a dark angel, sort of their protector against somebody who's even darker than than he is, um, because he's made dark only really by his need for revenge. You know, that's well, the only his, thing. His random murdering of cats. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, that's truly weird. Which yeah. is the tie, the only the real tie to the story. The cat's still alive. He just. He just threw a knife at it. I'm really when, wondering what the hell is the deal. Well, no, with the they cat. say he killed the cat. So yeah, yeah, but the cat's alive, clearly. So I think maybe he's got because nine the, lives. Or or them. Karloff has a house full of black cats because he's a Satan. That could be, but it, they never do explain why the hell he's so obsessed with the well, cat. Well, like he seems really terrified by it. I mean, that is the only tie to the post story. But they they say yeah. he killed it, but then they also keep talking about how cats are immortal and yeah. it's probably going to come back. Like, I think it's the same damn cat. I, I do. I don't think it's two different cats. Or the three or the four. cat you never comes saw another back. One. The uh, yeah. I I just wanted to point out in the scene where where uh, David Manners is saying I would like to go I would like to go to town and continue on our trip and they're like oh well uh, why don't you uh, can we go with the gendarme no they're on bicycles can we uh, take the car no the car is out of service I never use it oh can I phone and it's like the phone is dead and Karloff has the best damn shit eating grin line I've ever seen where he turns to Lugosi who again. Two people who want to flay one another alive. And he says, do you hear that? Even the phone is dead. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's, it's like it's like a line that you would hear in the theater. You know, yeah, it's, it's a, a line. it's a line that you would hear if this were a play and everybody in the well, audience. That's when the guy's like, let's get the hell out of here. I don't care if we have to walk. I don't care about our luggage. We're out of here, man. <laughs> Yeah. This would actually make a pretty good stage play. It'd be it really would. expensive yeah. to recreate the sets, but um it would be pretty cool. I I I I would actually like love to see a staged version of this. You could I think you could you could be smart about how you did the absolutely you know, the sets. Like, oh, absolutely. You could do this in a heartbeat. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, the, these sets, you know, they'd be awesome, but you're not talking about, you don't have to put a river on the stage like you do with Phantom of the Opera. Or swing a chandelier or any of that. Yes, I would go see a stage play version of Black Cat 1934 in a heartbeat. Anyway, almost immediately after that, as they're preparing to leave, uh, Mrs. Peltzik arrives and says uh she reveals who she is that she is the the daughter of bella lugosi and she married um and she's married to karloff and what she doesn't know is that lugosi is alive and immediately after that conversation happens they are discovered by karloff who murders her off screen it happens super fast i mean this thing is only an hour long so they're spinning the axe really fast he's like ah you are discovered and i and and she's dead and that takes you almost immediately to the final act which is a satanic ritual uh uh does anybody want to explain what the plan is at this uh, satanic ritual do we know what the plan is at the satanic ritual it gets there. pretty weird so the you know the cult shows up which i guess they're locals they all yeah. seem to be very high society yes um he ties her to kind of a bondage cross yes and is gonna i assume he's gonna sacrifice her yeah that's a sacrifice that's the impression i get yeah and yeah you know that it's not it's not like a he, she's gonna be possessed by something um there doesn't see, appear to be any sexual things going on although they have some pretty crazy like designed bondagey yeah. dresses on with all the the 
where all of the like piping is, it's definitely, you know, dudes yes. are all in kind of suits and women all wear these gothy white, but with like gothy bondage bits on I them. thought they were like, like weird Greek, you know, like. Yeah, like, they're just, they're just gossamer Greek gowns with, with, right. tape, with like gold tape on them, which is. Well, the, all like, of the, like, all of the like outlines are all like, and yes. accentuate yeah. everything. <laughs> in the, in the, a, the original really notes. striking. Uh, like the the design is just really interesting, and I hated those pushes. dresses. I thought they looked no. really bad. I thought they were just somebody just took some white nightgowns and to put gold tape on them, and it just looked stupid to me. The the uh, this was supposed to be highly sexual. None of it makes right. it into the movie. But uh, the when the bad when the good guys are escaping later, as the castle is about to blow up, they're supposed to pass by. All of the Satanists engaged in a in a whole bunch of Satan hanky panky uh, in in this big uh, room, and uh, the censors were like, "I don't see how you're going to do that, even here, as we stand in pre code Hollywood. I, we, right. we we just don't see that happening. So none of that happens. But uh, uh, yes, she's going to be sacrificed. Um, uh, the censors had big problems with the broken cross thing. Uh, you know, the fact that he's like there. You know, the, all of the crosses, there are crosses everywhere. Uh, but Tony, you were going to say something. Well, what the only thing that didn't make a lot of sense to me is at, out of the blue, one of the women, the what allows for some of the escape is one of the women just cries out and is overwhelmed. Yes. Yes. Which there, I don't know if there was a cut. I'm not sure what happened, but it didn't. I watched it a couple of times to see if I, you know, missed something. It's not but clear. just, ah! And then everybody goes, oh, no, one of our members is freaked out. And that allows uh, uh, it's not the clear. escape. Yeah, is... it's uh, it, her ecstatic collapse suddenly distracts. It, that's what I'm saying about the stupid damsel in distress thing. It really annoys me how they just they just seem to pass out. And by the way, did you guys, uh, and I may have missed it, but did you guys mention the daughter of, of um, Bella Lugosi being the wife of Oh yes, yeah, and and she's right. murdered, and and yeah. and this is actually during this escape, Lugosi tries to help them escape, but as he enters the room, he immediately finds his daughter, having grown to adulthood and now dead. Now in the original, this, this is what I mean when I say it's super dark. It's so dark. In the original outline, it was darker. It was going to be like in the pawnbroker. He was going to find her hanging on a hook. That doesn't happen. Because uh, you know, they I think they just decided that's too much. I don't know. I, well, I... now, after, not too long after that, um, you know, there's there's the whole thing um, with the husband who's been, you know, we don't know for sure. He ends up not being dead, but he's in prison uh, in the basement as well. But not too long, Karloff shows up and they grab him and you know put him on a uh, in this kind of in another more like. You know, yeah. bondage kind of thing, strap him up, you know, and Lagosi's, you know, it's no longer figured if he is cutting his skin off. Yes. You know, in yes. the shadow, they just show the shadow, but, but it's some, pretty clear. In some ways, Whoa. that's more disturbing to see it in, in shadow. Oh, no. It's effective as hell. Yeah. Yeah, for real. Yeah. But, they, you know, they you, they cut away. And you're like, oh, well, I guess they cut away. Then they show the shadow. You know, they cut back to it. And you can tell he's working hard to get Karloff's skin off of him. Ugh. Oh, yeah. And there's a, it's there's pretty a line crazy. about it. Yeah. So that's going on. And our our heroes are trying to get away, but she's still she's still locked up. And as Lugosi tries to help free her, he gets shot by David Manners. And Lugosi's like, "You guys are idiots! Get out of here! Um, you you poor fool!" And then he decides that uh, he's going to just blow up the uh, castle with the Satanists and the memory of all the butchery that happened here. And luckily there is a blow up the lab lever nearby. Um, and there's a, there's a line that they gave us earlier going, amazingly, this place is, you know, set on, you know, just mountains and mountains of dynamite for reasons unexplained. And so he's got a lever, he's going to pull it. It's literally, we belong dead. Can you believe he it? Says, well, he's also been shot, so he's probably going to die soon anyway. Yes. Um, Bella is. And so he, uh, yeah, he pulls the lever, and he's like, okay, we have five minutes, and then it's about 20 seconds later that the thing blows up. Luckily, yes. the, 
our heroes have been able to escape, but all the all the people, the cult people, I guess, go up with the building. I'm assuming. I don't yeah. guess they get out. Right. Well, they got their orgy going on, and they yeah. and they, which we don't see, but they get yeah they get destroyed. You know, so mass murder. They all die. Our heroes get away. Uh, and then there's a denouement in a carriage, and I actually can't completely tell if this conversation is taking right away or like weeks later because he's got a newspaper and is reading one of his book reviews, and it's about how his his imagination is just too crazy for the real world, which is cute. And and that's the end. That's the end of of uh, of the Black Cat, which has damn near nothing. Nothing, nothing to do with the the story of the black cat, but I think is <laughs> other than an immortal story. black cat. The cat, yes. you know, the cat dies and comes back, but that's very much ancillary to the to the actual tale. It was shoved in, I think, just because they wanted some excuse to call it the black cat. I swear to God, I, I I really think that. Um, golly, so that's that is the black cat. Uh, I want to get our our final thoughts and see if there was something that we failed to to comment on. Uh, Julia, lay it on me. Yep. I mean, is there anything that we didn't hit here? Um, no, I mean, we talked about the uh, the atmosphere and and. I did think that the effect of the women in the glass cases was amazing. I just think that it was, especially given the actual context of how this guy treated his, um, the, at least this one woman, if not all of them, uh, it's just very, very dark. But, uh, you know, and the whole business of, of Bella's daughter having been basically kidnapped and forced to be married to this guy her whole life. I don't know. I just, there's so many things. And then this, the damsel in distress, who's the lead of the, you know, not the lead, but the main, the, the, the ingenue of the film. Um, she's completely useless. I mean, when he goes and kills the girl because she's been talking to, um, to, uh, I'm sorry, what's the, the, the girlfriend's name that's the, the new girl to the, to the, to the set, to the scene? Uh, you, you're, you're talking about Miss Allison? Julie Bishop. Yeah, yeah. She, um, is talking to his wife, and so then he kills his wife, I guess, out of, because now she's been discovered. And um, and she's completely useless. Like she doesn't go after. She doesn't try to go in the door. She doesn't even yeah. scream out or anything. She's just like. I mean, she screams. I think. I don't even think she screams. I think she just goes. No, you're right. But I'm like, why do they have to be such useless women in this movie? Um, but uh, yeah, there's the, the. It's just extremely dark. Those themes and. Um, I haven't read the post story, so I I don't know how much of it is actually drawn from it, but um, I imagine a lot of the darkness comes from that. But um, yeah, I think uh, I think it's just really interesting to look at, and um, there's definitely a lot of images that I would have loved. I loved. I always envisioned making a poster out of it, even though I don't have movie posters. But I always want to make movie posters when I'm watching the movies. Going, oh, I want a movie poster of just Boris and Bella on the screen because they look so cool. Um, so yeah, it was it was very interesting, and I'm glad we watched it. We can definitely find such a poster, by the way. That's that one. That one. I, yeah. You know, if oh man, it makes me wish. There's yet another movie I wish that in an alternate universe there was. If you can imagine, what I would love to see is two them take these characters, and it's two like super villains trying to get revenge against each other. And any superhero or or civilian in between them is just fodder. Yeah. But it's all about like they're yeah. not heroes at all. I would love to see these two characters as super villains against each other in a world trying to go, I just want there to stop fighting so that everything's not just destruction and chaos. You mean like Doctor Doom and Magneto, basically? You know? Yeah, sort of, yeah. That kind of <laughs> thing. But these two, yeah, you know, that would yeah. oh man, I wanna live in the universe where that was made. No, uh, I, I think Bella Lugosi would have been an excellent Doctor Doom. Yes. Oh man, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Drew, what are your final thoughts? Well, other than now, I want to somehow create a time machine so we can have Bella Lugosi be Doctor Doom. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I, I love. I, I. This is a movie I've been wanting to discuss for a long time. So you know, when when the subject of doing a Lugosi uh, retrospective came up, this is of course one of the ones that I pushed to do. Um, I love this movie. I, I. You know, I, I hear what Julia is saying about the, the female characters in the movie, and I, I completely, of course, understand that. But there is still a lot to like about that movie going into it and understanding that it does have some 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 conventions and tropes that might seem problematic to 
to our our uh, more more modern sensibilities. Um, and Lagosi and Karloff together, you know, are just they have such a good chemistry with each other in this movie. Like just any scene where the two of them are batting dialogue off each other is just a treat. So yes. I, I, I really enjoyed going back and, you know, share, sharing this and hopefully people who have never seen this movie, and, but listen to our podcast um, will in turn, uh, you know, maybe check this movie out. So I, I'm glad that we did it. Fantastic. Tony. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I really, really enjoy this movie. I, it's especially the bits where, uh, you know, we have the villains or villain and anti-hero sparring against each other, literally playing chess, you know, and it's so, they're, they're so good at threatening each other outright when they're together. And then people walk in like, oh, so what about, you know, gentlemanly stuff? <laughs> Like, yeah. how how about chess and wine and whiskey and things that gentlemen talk to each other about in an elevated manner? <laughs> it's, yeah. it's great. And it turns almost in a dime. And everybody's looking around like, did we walk into something? Like, I think we walked into something. Yeah. But they seem to be okay. So I guess we're good. Um, You know, fantastic practical effect stuff going on with that. Especially, it's, and it's shot so well. I, I'm still impressed at the way that this house comes about as well. It seems so futuristic because, you know, again, so much Art Deco became what became what was futurism or retro futurism or all this the stuff that gets peppered into future sci-fi. Yeah. This house seems ultra super modern yeah in, you know in 34. It's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. The it's just great to see these two guys sparring against each other. It does. Yeah. Add, add it, throw in Dr. Fives and you've got like this super triumvirate. It would be amazing. <laughs> That's a really excellent point. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The um, I think there's so much here. Considering this is a one hour film, uh, this is, there's so much here in it. And it's so captures it's it's perfect in and, and as and as far as that idea of taking the nightmares of modern life the nightmares of the great war and translating them them into a strange uh a strange poetry of mechanized death and gnarled trees and collapsing roads and memories of bodies stacked 15 high it is uh it, it is a, a perfect example of that theory that universal horror at this time was retelling the horrors of World War I and trying to turn them into something that mankind could retain sanity by holding them in context. Uh, I am uh, really happy that we watched this because I don't think I'd ever seen it before. I really, uh, I, I, so uh, I, it was a treat for me. Uh, let us get our uh endorsements i'm just dying to know I, I know what i've spent the last three days watching uh and it's nothing like any of this so i'm dying to know what you guys have uh have been up to same order julia do you have anything to endorse for us um i have two things that neither of which are horror related one is um i listened to this podcast that is uh with rachel maddow podcast called Bagman. And it's about the fascinating story of Spiro Agnew, who was the vice president under Nixon, and his his own crazy corrupt past, his, his past before the being the vice president, and then during the while being the vice president, he was like taking bribes and all. It was just crazy stuff. But but people never really heard about it that much because of the Nixon thing. So you never really knew what was going on with that. But it's just fascinating. I was it was like seven episodes and, and that's it and it's really really cool and then also i'm sure jason will talk about this as well but we've we've been to watch the new season of the marvelous mrs Maisel um this weekend and it was just fantastic it's so funny it's so well written it's so interesting um i just really really enjoy it so if any if you like i mean it's by the maker of the gilmore girls so if you like the gilmore girls but even <laughs> if you just like comedy or if you just like um you know, just interesting writing and neat set design and gorgeous costumes. My God, the woman who wears the most amazing clothes. It's uh, what did we say it was nineteen 
It's supposed six, to be 59 or so. 59, yeah. yeah. Just amazing. Uh, everything is, is very, very pretty to look at as well. So it's, it's neat. It's a neat show. Wonderful. It sounded Thank like you. somebody disappeared. Did somebody, did they pop back in again? I dropped off briefly, but I'm here. Oh, okay. uh, Drew, do you have anything to endorse for us? Well, of, of course, The Marvelous Miss Maisel is, is, is great, and I recommend that. But I would also like to endorse a show that uh, is not getting as widely talked about, but I, I find it to be excellent. Um, my, my, uh, this last week, I, I took in the, the TV version of Get Shorty which just cropped up on Netflix. And I kind of took a gamble on it because I didn't really know what to, what to, you know, expect from it. Of course, you know, there's a very famous film version of it from the nineties with John Travolta. Um, The TV show is quite a bit darker than the, than the film, but it's, it's excellent. And, you know, I I don't want to say too much about it, it except that it retains the, the plot of a, uh, mob enforcer getting involved with the the movie business and you know darkly comedic things ensue but it's it's very very different from the film and um well worth watching excellent performances on it so i you know if you have netflix you really should check it out i i i I think that this is a TV show that more people need to be paying attention to because it's just so well done. I've heard that. I've heard that. Thank you very much. Uh, Tony, what about you? Well, thanks for the endorsement because that's on my queue. So Mm -hmm. I need to check it out. Um, Worth it. Yeah, it seems like I've heard nothing but good. Um, I caught the Christmas Chronicles with Kurt Russell as Santa Claus, which is not a great movie, but all the Kurt Russell as Santa Claus parts are pretty huh. amazing <laughs> like it that that was genius casting in the way it plays out the movie itself uh ups and downs but uh anytime kurt russell's on the screen it's it's pretty awesome i will i will that have to say cool. um i haven't i don't have much else because i've mainly been working and then also trying to get everything back together for deserts of mars we have a new guitarist and we're working really really hard to start playing out early as early next year as possible so uh working on new tunes um yeah that's been my main thing. That and playing uh, Just Cause 4, um, which is a very cathartic game full of... Um, it, I am a big fan of the old school game Bionic Commando. And it's pretty much... You have a grappling hook that you can sail around and pull things, two things together. Or, you know, put a person on a balloon and fly them away. Or make two people, you know, attach a person to a oxyacetylene tank and then make that fly into the sky it's just it's just pure chaos and mayhem and uh you know with the pretty with the story and writing is good but just the amount of mayhem you can cause across a digital world is is pretty great and that's that's mainly what i've been doing that and oh also the fist of the north star game um i guess mainly i've been self-medicating with video games is basically what you can (laughs) yeah that's been my like well chaos and destruction on screen to combat the real world chaos that just seems way darker um but yeah that's basically what i've been doing when i haven't been doing other stuff in music you'll definitely get no judgment from me uh i for me uh i was i would endorse mazel but i think we've all said that that we love it so i'll add nothing to that i will say i also shot through every episode uh driving around this week shot through a new podcast called the dream which was is really good free listen to it on stitcher or wherever you get it's it's called the dream and it is an 11 episode look at multi-level marketing schemes and and how they scam people and i kind of literally want to take every Everybody in my life, and if they've never given any thought to any of this, I want them to listen to this podcast so that they never, ever, ever get suckered into, you know, selling diet shakes or whatever the hell, you know, it, it's, um, it's really good, really smart, really, uh, and it's really thoughtful and empathetic towards people, but uh, it's good. I, I really recommend The Dream if you want to hear about like the history of multi-level marketing companies and how people get ripped off and, and all kinds of stuff. Very, very good. Uh, so that's, that's it. We will be back next week 
with yet more Lugosi, and uh, and I can't wait. I mean, this was a fantastic movie to discuss. I'm really glad that we took the with, that we took the time to look at this, guys. Thank you very much for for being a part of it. I'm I feel very thankful. Awesome. Night Have everybody. a good night. Good night. Bye.